What's up? Welcome back to another episode of Visual Effects Artist React. We got a very unique episode today. We are joined on the couch by James Willingham, who's from the third floor. You guys specialize in previous stuff. This is where movies are born. This is where the action scenes are ideated upon raw pixels and polygons into something that gives you emotion. I haven't actually seen this show yet, but this one shot right here <laughs> may have hyped me up enough to actually go check this out. This is pretty sick. A lot of the stuff we do isn't often seen. It's, it's very early in development. I, I promise it's gonna look amazing. I imagine it's very rewarding to see, like, it's a completely different thing now, but it's still the same idea and the same concept. It's, it's, ama it's an amazing feeling. I would love to, to see an example of what this looks like. Should, All right, let's, should we let's, jump in? Let's check it out. Oh, you did Prey? Dude, I freaking love this movie. Oh yeah? Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> I love how it I love how it just feels like it's video game animations, but at the same yeah. time, like the animation and like the cinematography and the direction is like way nicer than you expect it to be based on like the graphics. Because you're used to like graphics like this playing a video game being from like a janky video game. Right. But something like, whoa, there's all this like direction and the storytelling and the in the camera work and this, you know, cinematography and the blocking. And this was right at the end of the project, and the team at this point had shrunk down to a single person being myself. <laughs> and, we had, and I had one week to finish it, and then we were done. And that's why, like, you see, like these the deer and stuff, just slight chest piecing along, sliding. Sure, yeah. Um, I would have meetings with Dan Trachenberg and brainstorm, and and you know, go over the shots, and we would find new shots together. It was super fun. It was an amazing collaboration. So you're keeping it in like a rough state because you need to work on it fast, right? You need to. It's like you're sculpting. You just need to like be able throw stuff on, look at it, take it off, and switch it around. Exactly, yeah. Did you hand animate that, or is that mocap at all? This was all keyframed. Yeah, gotcha. so I keyframed all of this, yeah. What would cause this to depart from the previous? Why did this depart from the previous? Sometimes I'm like, oh, this will be too difficult to get the camera in this position, or maybe this is too much for the stunt actor to perform, or it's just time comes down to it, I think. Again, like, like I was saying before, sometimes it's just about helping them think and getting the DNA of the idea in there. Mm -hmm. Just because it's not a carbon copy um, doesn't mean we didn't help them quite a bit. This was our, this was Pitch Fizz um, that was used to help get the film greenlit. Kind of like show the producers, like this is what it's gonna kind of feel like, what it's gonna kind of look like. Right, exactly. I this love is that because you're showing producers, you have to put a little bit more effort into making sure it looks better. <laughs> <laughs> right. How do you communicate to them? How do you put them in the mind space to ignore the things that aren't finished and pay attention to the things that matter? Uh, when I speak to a director or whoever, I'll say, listen, if we can get it across to you this way, it will be so quick and save so much time. And usually if you convey that information and they understand that, that it's gonna save them time and money, they tend to jump on with it. We call it CG goggles. It's like you gotta put on your CG goggles to really <laughs> kind of just look past the rough cut version of what we're seeing. And a lot of people, their heads don't fit goggles. Right, right. It's like, fine, I'll, get, I'll, I'll do a nice preview for you. <laughs> yeah. I promise it's gonna look amazing. <laughs> You have uh, all the assets in the scene, you have the cinematography, you have the animation. Which of those things would you say is the most important? I would say story, in, in, in this case, like is conveying exactly what needs to happen. They need to know where the cameras need to be, you know, in terms of like how they're gonna shoot it. Um, they need to know what lenses they're going to need. They need to know what right. the character is going to have to do. Are they going to are they going to have to have a stunt person? You know, what specifically is that stunt person going to have to do? It really helps just convey to the crew, everyone else that's going to work on this and try to execute this and make it look real later, exactly what they're going to need to do. When you're building out that out, do you need to worry about how it's going to be shot on set, or do you just start? with whatever comes to mind. Typically, you want to try to avoid cheating as much as you can because you don't want to desi design something that they get on set and they're like, this is impossible, we're never going to be able to do this. And those are things that we're definitely conscious of when we're planning these things. Okay, so you're actually thinking about how it needs to be, re be reproduced in real life. Right, absolutely, huh. yeah. And sometimes, you know, when you're when you're quickly racing through a sequence and you're just trying to figure out the story of it, you'll, you'll go back to do tech viz and get more technical with it. So I'm hearing an, a new term come from you that we haven't said on the show ever, which is tech viz. We've heard oh. pre viz. Okay. But we and haven't heard tech viz. Yeah. And post viz. And pitch viz. Yeah. And pitch viz. <laughs> All the vizzes. <laughs> <laughs> We're vizzing out. <laughs> 
in a film where there's a ton of CG stuff that's going to be in there, or, the, or if they were just planning something. Well, how are we going to do it? You'll achieve it. You'll get the, the sequence approved. All the shots are done. Now they're like, okay, well, how do we do it? You know, and we'll go in there and we'll, we'll, we'll tech vis everything. And you'll do like a camera, sort of a God's eye view, for example, different angles showing what the camera's doing, the rig. You'll have measurements in there as the, as the camera's moving around. Oh, now it's four feet. Now it's two feet from the subjects. And it's incredibly helpful. So it really is a blueprint, but for everybody on set, the right. entire team. Correct. Huh. Yeah. Do you call the final version of the movie like, Final Viz. Final Viz. <laughs> <laughs> we do now. <laughs> final Viz V2 underscore V3 yeah. underscore final for real. Final this Viz time. underscore final final <laughs> underscore for real this time. <laughs> <laughs> right. Hey Nico. Hey friend. No one will save you. Previs <laughs> corridor. <laughs> <laughs> This is No One Will Save You, scary alien invasion story. <laughs> that, that crinkling like <laughs> Right? This was Lance Darden, who was our previous supervisor on it, and then our <laughs> post <laughs> Third floor, we did board this, uh, working you know, closely with the director and getting that all planned out and approved. So you guys actually then, boarded this? We do have, like at third floor, we do have a, a story department and they'll board things, uh, uh, so we'll create an animatic with that. Once that was done, Lance went through and did a chess piece master scene of the whole thing. Kind chess of like piece? from a god's is, eye view. Oh, okay. Chess piecing, like sliding gotcha. the characters around. Then they would go in and flesh out the shots. So what is this now? What are we looking at here? This, look, this looks like it's the post viz done by Mr. Brian Carney. New term. one of our supervisors. Yeah. Post viz, new term. <laughs> yeah, post viz. <laughs> got a new viz yeah. again. So here we've got the actual film plate. So what we've added here is the CG character on the roof. But the idea here is just to kind of like get everyone on the same page about what it's going to look like. You're not necessarily trying to go out and make final visual effects happening here, right? Right, correct. Yeah. I like that he splats on the ground now. <laughs> he slips like, whoops. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> So like an idea like that where it comes down and he's like upside down but then looks at the camera like that, it's all very otherworldly and uncanny. How much of that is coming from the director like making the beat sheet for this or whatever? This one in particular, I'm not certain on who came up with that idea. I was asking Lance specifically about that and he was like, man, I'm trying to remember who it was. Brian was saying that part of the challenge was figuring out how, like with the size of this thing, how he would move within this vehicle, how they get him in there realistically so he couldn't reach the girl because he's got these really long arms, you know? Right, yeah. Um, you're trying to tell the story, you know, within the frame and fill in the blanks really with whatever is needed. Those are a lot of the technical challenges that come with post phys because at that point, it's like, okay, these are the shots. We don't have the infinite freedom of coming up with a million different shots. Like, we have to make it work in these shots and how do we do it, you know, in the most realistic way possible. Oh, it's changed again a little bit. He's just trying to lick that moon. <laughs> oh, there it is. Ah, there it, it is. Yep. <laughs> the gutter scrunch. The <laughs> <laughs> gutter scrunch. <laughs> Interesting. Wow, so they're really committed to the fall now. Like it truly slips and falls versus just landing. Right. Man, it's wild seeing how this transformed from the previous side of things to, all right, now we've shot it, but we still don't know what it's gonna look like yet. Mm. And then everyone finally gets onto the same page and it comes out like this. Right. There's that tech vision there, there, talking there about. There you go, there's some yeah, tech vision. with the numbers and everything. <laughs> What I love about this is that it's all the scale. Like, those are real world units there. And we also see the distance between the camera and the actor here because you don't want to hit the actor with the camera. Right. So you have to accommodate that. And it helps with eye lines, you know, you know where that dragon eye is so they can right. know, uh, put a, you know, a tennis, tennis ball, ball or whatever <laughs> there yeah, the actor can look at. This was Joanne oh. Smithies, a previous supervisor in London. There it is. Look at those eye lines. Solid. And now we know that the camera's about five feet behind her. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I know exactly how tall that dragon head is. <laughs> In the projects that you've prevised on, do you know going into it what kind of cameras they're going to be using? Oh, yeah. Is that very yeah. important? I mean, there are, time, there are times uh, when we'll start and we don't have that information, and then we'll get it sometimes halfway through. Usually they get it to us pretty early. And sometimes they'll be shooting with several different cameras. The project I'm on right now, there's, there's several different packages that they're using. You know, when we get to the post viz point, you know, they'll give us a list of what, what was shot, you know, with what camera, uh, the film back and the lens and et cetera. And we'll, we'll recreate those cameras, 
you know, digitally, so when we're adding in the post visits, it's all accurate. The dragon's really well animated for it being previous. Yeah, it's cool. Well, they go through a process um, where we'll do a pass at the whole scene. They would get that all approved. Then they would send the shots off to this company, Pixamundo. Because so, basically they're rigging it up to go onto their buck, that motion control rig yeah. that the actors yeah, would sit on. Yeah, absolutely. They would do a solve where, for example, the buck would only rotate so, but a lot of the times this thing needs to be flying around, you know, sometimes your, your dragon will be zipping past your camera. So they would have to do a solve where they would then take that animation of the flying dragon and put it onto the camera, you know, similar to the way they did with the old Star Wars movies. You sure, know, yeah. Flying the camera yeah. around the ships. So I haven't actually seen this show yet. Yeah, yeah, I right. should have, this but cool. this one shot right here <laughs> may <laughs> have hyped me up enough to yeah. actually go check it out. Watch the show. This is pretty sick. On this sequence, they didn't have boards on this one. So what they did though is the director and the DOP and the VFX soup planned out a lot of the sequence with little like uh, toy versions, little, totally. little, little yeah, like yeah. maquettes of the uh -huh. of the dragons, and they would film it. So they sort of create a little version of the sequence with that reference. You know, their own sort of real world previs in a sense, and they would use that as reference to build the sequence. So I think one of the biggest differences I've noticed between the previs and the final product is pacing. A lot of these scenes in the final thing are a lot longer than they are in the previs. Mm -hmm. To let the moment breathe, maybe just we need a little bit more time to live in this moment perhaps. For sure, yeah, you, you, you're throwing the clay on there, getting a very quick rough version of it, and then you kind of, once you see it all in its entirety, it kind of helps you see oh, I know ways to make this better, I know ways to make this moment better. Because it's so early and it's such a collaboration with so many different people, um, it's not like you write something and then execute it and it's gonna be perfectly exactly what you did. It usually ends up having the DNA of the idea, but it's just, it's just another step to help get to that final piece, so. And you can really see how this would need all that planning, because all those shots of the person that you're getting. Your principal photography is happening in the computer. The actor is just like an element at this point, but you need to have that element planned and you need to have it choreographed with everything else that's happening. The wind, the lightning, the rain, the atmosphere. Flying in clouds is not as easy to film as one might think because it tends to be just surrounding you like a fog to get detail and form and lighting and all that kind of stuff. In some cases, they'll have the editor or an editor right there, like on set, on that, you know, when they're shooting so they can just drop shots in right away. I know like Peter Jackson did that at, at Weta. How much did Peter rely on previs? Quite a bit. We prevised tons of material. One of the most challenging sequences I've ever done, maybe like the dragon Smaug destroying Lake Town when he crashed down into the town. I pitched this idea to the VFX soup about the dragon crashing down like a 747, but it was this long, sort of convoluted idea where I had him like coughing up lava blood and crawling around. Lava and stuff. blood. Lava it blood. It was this whole. I just kind of went off the rails, and <laughs> and he was like, "All right, well, let's let, maybe let's try to <laughs> let's let's bring that back down a bit. And what are you have him crash down? That's cool, but just have him kind of get his wing up and fly up, and then crash down and die. Because Peter always like wanted him to fall straight down in. Like, what was really challenging about it? Like, was it the just the nuance, like the technical detail of it? Yeah, with the, like getting the getting the the animation right, the path on the dragon, you know how he would fly when he fell down through the town, you know breaking up all those buildings. I was just breaking up all the geometry You're just myself my hand, and aren't just you? animating all the geo. Oh, yeah, man. I wasn't doing any simulations. So if something or changes, like that, you have to go just, in. Oh man, change yeah. all that. Yeah, oh, exactly. That's a lot of work. Um, oh yeah. Like I did it as one big shot. Now it's been cut up into different shots, which is which is great. I'm glad they did it. Yeah, I can see why that would have been really tough. <laughs> yeah, it was, a wild, it was a wild one. How many iterations yeah. did you go through? Oh, I mean, I was I worked on that shot for weeks, a couple of weeks, I think, if I recall. Sometimes what we do is we help the director think. You know, he'll see what we've done and he'll go, "Oh God, that gave me a great idea," and then he'll you know give you his thoughts. Then you go back and you rehash it, and you kind of working together create this this product. Like, and in the end, when you get to sit there in the theater and you're seeing it, you're like, oh my gosh, that idea, that, that idea was mine. But it's, you know, everybody's ideas all, all kind of hashed together. Animation department at Weta is so good. <laughs> really cool team down there. I'm, I'm still dear friends with a lot of those guys. How do you get into previs? Is it like, do you, does it require like a very overactive imagination and a lot of like dedication to action figure photography or like what is, like how does one get into previs? Um, well one I think, you know, a passion for film. We're a bit of generalists um, uh, for the most part, you know, where we're doing our own tracking, we're doing our own animating in Maya. post -vis, you're doing compositing, you're doing the rotoscope, you know, all, all the roto work. Some previs artists are good with uh, 
with effects and simulations. But as far as entry, we've got people that we hire right out of school, we've got people that are more experienced in the industry, that come from an animation background, and sometimes those people will come in and you have to train them up on camera and cinematography and things of that nature. Right, Because yeah. yeah, that's, that's another big one with previs, is you really have to understand camera work and cinematography, you know? So it's a little bit of everything, you know, performance, story, compositing, all, all that stuff. The Third Floor, they have a YouTube channel. You guys are just you're dropping a show right now, right? We are. It's called Artist vs. Deadline. Like, it's where we'll take a couple supervisors and kind of put them up against each other. We'll give them different sort of themes, and, and there's there's you'll get a list of props and things like that. I think they draw out of a hat. Yeah, and they'll have a week to execute a little short. That sounds like something we would do. I'm, I'm on board <laughs> with this. Yeah. yeah. So in the past, we've looked at animations that people have made just for fun. They have this crazy energy. They kind of, they feel like previs. And you know, those are hidden gems, and I would love it if any of you could recommend some of those other hidden gems, those really crazy animations that people are just doing on their own that have that kind of like that previs energy. I'd love to take a look at them so we can look at them on Visual Effects Artists React in the future. So leave a comment. They're right. <laughs> That's the thing. <laughs> well, James, the third floor, thanks for joining us. I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me. You, know, you guys do great stuff and it's cool to, uh, to be a part of it. So yeah, I appreciate it. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for stooping down to the first floor with us. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. Anytime. Grant, have you been waiting on that for like since we started the episode? You have no idea. <laughs> that, was, that, that was beautiful. I came up with that like five seconds ago. <laughs>